Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Dean Obridala, and with me today is Congressman Joe Kennedy III, a Democrat representing the 4th District in Massachusetts. Now he's also running for the Senate in the Democratic primary coming up later this year. Congressman Kennedy, nice to see you again. Hey, good to see you. Pleasure. So welcome to Salon Talks. And let me ask you about Massachusetts hit very hard by COVID-19. You've yeah. had over 70,000 cases, almost 4,000 of your fellow residents of your state have perished from this. How much help do you still need from the federal government to, take the, to get this under control? A lot. Um, and let's be clear, Dean, that the reason why the impact of this virus has been so bad here has been, I think in many respects, the failure of the federal government to provide the very basics upon which we should expect them uh, to provide and that we would need to rely on. So from the beginning, I've been engaged with our governor here, Governor Baker in Massachusetts, and asked him nearly two months ago, what is it that you need and how can we help? And it was testing and it was PPE, right? The, 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 the basics that you need to protect a community from the spread of this virus. We didn't have enough of PPE, despite having some of the best hospitals and healthcare institutions you will find anywhere in the world. You didn't have enough for our first responders, our EMTs, our firefighters, our police officers. We have about half of the deaths that we've, uh, fatalities that we've had here in Massachusetts have been through nursing homes and senior centers, where it's been absolutely devastating. Um, and um, that failure to be able to get in front uh, of the spread of the virus, this failure to have robust uh, tests available despite the proclamations from this administration have been uh, devastating. And lastly, Dean, we've got a long way to go from this. Um, I was in Chelsea, um, Massachusetts, on a, which is a community east of Boston, as, as you know, on Tuesday. I have lived in developing countries all over the world. I have never seen a line so long for food as I saw on Tuesday in Chelsea. Hundreds and hundreds of people in the United States of America in 2020 standing outside uh, waiting for food. And the impact that this virus is gonna have on lower income communities, on fragile communities, um, is gonna be one we're gonna be confronting for a long, long time to come. The disparity to black and Latinos is something we've covered on my show a lot. It's heartbreaking. You know, They're on their front lines working hard jobs and risking their lives. Now you've got a situation which states need help from the federal government to balance their budget. 46 out of 50 states can't have a deficit. Now you have Donald Trump mimicking Mitch McConnell's no blue state bailout. What's your reaction? On, and if they really don't provide help, what is the real world impact on a state like Massachusetts and other states? So Dean, this is again, a, just a, another complete farce um, and falsity from uh, this administration. One, you look at the states that actually are donors back to the federal government, which is to say that they, receive, they, they, they send more money in federal taxes to the government than the money that we receive. <laughs> New York is like number one on the list. Uh, Massachusetts, we send more money than we get back. So the idea that somehow you're, you're talking about a, a blue state bailout, well, you look at the, the states that actually receive more than they send back, but that is like the heart of President Trump's base. And there's no one, none of, none of my constituents that have tried to say, hey, when we're talking about trying to, to provide uh, programs and assistance to, to folks in the, in the South or in the Midwest after a tornado saying, hey, we, we don't think we should be spending our dollars in a, in a red state bailout because you got hit with a, a storm. But that's not what we say. There's nobody here that tried to say, hey, we, we should send tax dollars to Texas after Hurricane Harvey, uh, Mar excuse me, Hurricane Maria. Um, Right, or send down to Florida after those hurricanes. Nobody said that. So the idea that somehow the appropriate response in this moment is to pit one segment of Americans against another is horrifying. And the, the idea that that's going to be the reaction of the president uh, of the United States, it is um, sad, um, but it is not surprising. And also sad and not surprising, and I think actually cruel, is Trump just vowed gleefully in the Oval Office to end the ACA. They're in federal court. And the DOJ had a chance to reverse their position and not argue to end all the benefits of the ACA. And at the very same breath, Donald Trump says, but well, don't worry, we've got a great plan to cover pre-existing health conditions, which he said last year in June to George Stephanopoulos and promised in two months we'd have it. And we don't have it. How dangerously misleading is that to Americans who might not be following closely that, hey, don't worry, I got you on pre-existing conditions when they don't. 
you know, I, I think if there's one uh, potential silver lining of the course uh, over the past three years or so of this administration, it's that most folks don't believe Donald Trump when they, he talks about healthcare, because he's been talking about that great plan that he has uh, to, to ensure everybody, yet we still haven't seen it. We talked about how they were going to repeal and replace, and they didn't do that because the American public, and in fact, a number of Republicans actually stood up and said, we know you don't have a plan, and you can't take health care away from millions of Americans and not have a plan. And the idea, Dean, that you think that this would be the appropriate response in the middle of a pandemic is just stunning. But again, not surprising. So is it dangerous? Absolutely. Is it playing to uh, a political base off of talking points that aren't true and are going to be so unbelievably devastating if they came to pass? Yeah. Do, have we seen this president put politics above the well-being of the American people before? Yeah, almost every day. And do we see him mislead the American public about it? Yes, every day. And, you know, I, I wish I could tell you I expected more or better out of him, but I don't. Well, the good thing is yourself and Congressman Jayapal is involved with it. Well, I'm friends with, with her as well. You want to expand Medicare during this difficult time for people who lose their jobs, who can't afford COBRA benefits or can't afford uh, any kind of coverage to the ACA. Tell people a little bit about it, because I think this is so fundamentally important. With 33 million as of today out of work, that number is actually higher as we're going to find out going forward. So the, the basic on this is, again, very, very basic. It's to say that in the midst of a uh, pandemic across this country, that your health dean and my health are linked. And that's something that we know to be true because as we're trying to make sure that we, the reason why we are socially distanced is to make sure that if you catch this virus that you don't spread it to me and if I catch it, I don't spread it to you. And so if we know that, that your health and mine are linked and we know that we wanna make sure that we cure this, that we get in front of this disease and we stop its spread so that I can get better and you can get better, then we need to make sure that you can get access to healthcare and I can get access to healthcare. And that's the very basics. And so, yes, I'm a huge supporter and have been for, of Medicare for All. And we need to get to that place where every single person gets access to the health care they need when they need it. But what this bill does as an, in a, as an immediate step is to say, if you lost your job, and so when we have so many people, um, 140 plus million people that are um, based off of, uh, 160 plus million people that are based off of employer-sponsored health care, if you lose your job, you, you might not have health care anymore. So this says, if you've lost your job, we're going to cover you with Medicare. And we're also going to have a dramatic expansion of Medicaid. And we're going to make sure that any uh, healthcare related to COVID-19, so not just testing, but also treatment, that there's no cost sharing, that we're going to make sure that you get healthy so that if you happen to get sick, not just sick, but really sick, so that you're one of those folks that's on a ventilator for a couple of weeks and spends weeks inside a hospital. And we are able, thank God, to save your life. You don't come back out and say, hey, I'm experiencing financial devastation for the rest of my life and will be paying off those medical bills for as long as I live. Because that's not the appropriate thing to do in the richest, most powerful nation in the world. And it's not the right thing to do when we are spending trillions of dollars to try to float an economy to then turn around and tell somebody that just because you got sick, it's up to you to figure out your pathway out of it or face financial devastation. I don't believe that that's the country we have to be. And the bill that I filed with Congresswoman Jayapal proves it. Absolutely. And I don't know if people are aware of it, how expensive COBRA could be, where COBRA provides you coverage just through the federal law. It could be twelve, fourteen hundred dollars a month for a couple. It could be 2000 a month for a family. And if you're on already just unemployment, even with enhanced, it burns through everything. How do you pay your bills? And that will take into something else. You, you have a, a more generous proposal to help workers because despite what people think, there's a poll today, 77% of Americans think they're going to get back to their job really quickly. Economists say that's probably not true. It might be 50% who get their job more quickly with 50% still out of work for extended period of time. What are you going to do to help those people who are out of work for a long period of time? The, the first piece on this was, look, this is why I called for a $4,000 direct cash uh, payment months ago, was to say, hey, look, it, if the crisis that we're confronting is a healthcare crisis because are of a novel virus and a country that was not prepared for its onslaught, which is the reality of it, although we should have been more prepared than we were. Right. And that in order to mitigate the spread of this virus, we had to shut down our economy. Then the federal government's got to step in and say, hey, let's make sure that people can focus on their health, not get sick, and if you are sick, to get well, without worrying about financial devastation. 
And that means we've got to pay your bills. And what Congress did was say, hey, we'll give you 1200 bucks. Dean, I've done town halls all over the state. There's not a single time in those audiences where I've asked almost every single one of them. The average social security payout is about $1,200. I have asked in almost every single one of those town halls, how many of you could live on 1200 bucks a month in Massachusetts? Not a single hand has ever gone up. So if our objective here is to try to say, look, stay home, get healthy, don't spread this disease, we didn't give people the tools to do that. What we did was to give them something to provide some semblance of, uh, of uh, security, but not enough where they could actually do what we needed them to do. And so what happens? People go to work because they have to, or because they're essential workers and we need them to. And yet we don't supply them with PPE and we don't secure the, the public transit routes. And we don't make sure that they have the tools that they need in order to stay healthy. And so what happens? They get sick. And what do they do? They spread it. And so what do we need to do? We need to do an awful lot more to actually treat essential workers as essential human beings. To recognize that, as, as Reverend uh, William Barber and I wrote in a Washington Post editorial recently, that if we're going to translate the, or trans, uh, excuse me, start to call them, tra train, change the name from being service workers to essential workers, that we actually treat them as though they are essential, which means a living wage, which means they're going to have health care. <laughs> which means they're not going to be uh, taken advantage of and exploited the way in which an economy at this point is set up to exploit them. It's treating with the basic dignity that we should, every American deserves and every worker should demand. And that's not too much to ask, particularly in this moment where when we are so dependent on them to keep our society moving. You have a new proposal that just came out. And I, I love seeing yourself, Congressman Kennedy, and others, Jayapal, Pocan, and others, we're using this opportunity to try to make government what it could be in the way that FDR during the Great Depression rolled out a new deal. And your new proposal, it's called Civil Gideon, based on Gideon versus Wainwright. Tell people about this, because this is groundbreaking and it's, it's so desperately needed, frankly. It is desperately needed and it's a long time coming. And Dean, this has been an issue that I've been focused on for, for years. Um, going back to my time as actually a law student um, working in Boston Housing Court here uh, in Massachusetts in the midst of the last financial collapse, trying to keep low-income families in their homes in the midst of a foreclosure crisis when they didn't do anything wrong. And yet the laws were set up to provide them protections. But if you didn't know about them or you didn't know how to leverage them, you didn't know how to access them, then you were actually run right out of a home that you could have stayed in. And so I, I took that experience with me to Congress. I founded a, a legal aid caucus here. Uh, we've increased funding for the Legal Services Corporation, which is, is responsible for the um, majority of, of legal aid funding across this country. We've been able to increase the uh, uh, funding for legal aid, but we know we need to go farther. And we know coming out of this crisis, it's going to be all that more important. And so the resolution that we draft, which, by the way, I'm very proud of, has um, some, some proud progressive voices, but is also bipartisan, recognizing that there is bipartisan support for saying that in in today's society, even in civil courts, and not just criminal cases where the Miranda rights apply right to an attorney, but in civil cases, when you get to the heart of what some of these cases are about, about the basic needs, so for everything from sustenance, to housing, to, uh, to safety, to child custody, families, that in these areas of basic need, you need to have a lawyer by your side. And so this resolution and the, and the legislation that will follow it is about codifying that right into law and is a, one of the great expansions of, of uh, civil rights in this country and, and uh, it, certainly in modern times. And remarkably, there's a, such a diverse coalition of organizations that are supporting this. Is there any one that stands out for you as an example you can give to people? You have so many from LGBTQ community to domestic violence issues uh, to children. Is there any one without being dismissive of any other? <laughs> I love them all. Look, my friend. <laughs> so, so I mean, of these groups, I mean, like, of where you can give an example to people of how a lawyer in civil court would help you in a situation where someone can't afford that help. So, I mean, the, the, the basic one was the one that I was in, right? Um, so uh, the, the time, all the times that I was in court trying to defend somebody from an eviction who didn't do anything wrong, right? These are the cases that I had were tenants normally in a home. The, the owner of that home defaulted on the mortgage. Um, the conditions of the house, they were in pretty dire shape because if you're not paying your mortgage, you're also probably not paying the upkeep. And so a bank would come in, take over the, the home, take over the, uh, the mortgage and look around and see how terrible the conditions were. And rather than fix them, which would cost money, they just evicted everybody. 
And we're saying, hey, these, these tenants, they have legal possession, as they call it, possession of the, uh, of the apartment. They, they have rights. Let's avail them of those rights so that they have at least some, some time and civility and money to be able to, to find out what that next chapter holds for them. But I think one of the reasons why you have such a broad swath of, of organizations that are supporting this legislation, Dean, is because of the wide variety of ways in which this impacts people. I, I remember uh, a couple of years ago going down to the House floor trying to um, raise support for legal services funding. And I brought with me a New York Times piece um, that talked about the in, uh, impact that legal services have uh, across the country. And it highlighted the story of um, uh, a family in a state in the Midwest whose farm was under foreclosure, their home and farm were under foreclosure because a clerk in uh, the town had inputted a tax uh, payment with, uh, with a typo. And it went in as an unpaid tax lien and the system then started a foreclosure process. And the family couldn't understand what happened. They, they didn't know how to stop it. They were about to lose their home. They had a legal aid attorney who found the error and was able to save that family their house. And so I went to my pretty conservative colleague and said, hey, you should really fund, we need your help to fund legal services because it is your last line of defense against an overbearing government. Right? It is your last line of defense for you to be able to celebrate. If, if we codify these rights so that they should apply to me and they apply to you, but if, they, if you needed them, you could find access to an attorney so that your rights would be defended. What we have in this country is the rights that our legislatures fought for and put in place. We just don't allow people to actually avail themselves of those rights. What this bill will do is make sure that our law actually does what we say it does, which is treat everybody equally make sure that everybody has access to it. That's what this is about. And that's what we can do. And I'm, uh, I'm really proud of the, the, the amount of support that we've gotten. Again, the broad base and the, uh, the diversity of opinions to recognize that our civil justice system and our justice system still falls far short of what we should just, uh, hope that it accomplishes. I agree. And as, as a former practicing attorney myself, people so often didn't know their rights and they didn't know they were being taken advantage of. Just having the information, having someone there to help them is so fundamental. Let's talk about a few political issues. Uh, Michael Flynn, according to the deal, a short time ago, Donald Trump's DOJ, Michael, Bill Barr, is now dropping the charges against Michael Flynn. And as everyone knows, Donald Trump has led a charge to get rid of these charges since meeting James Comey in the White House in 2017 through just tweeting days ago. Is it hard to have confidence that DOJ did an independent evaluation that just didn't do what Donald Trump their boss told them to do? Look, I've got grave concerns as to the uh, objectivity of uh, Bill Barr um, uh, and uh, the, we've seen on a number of different occasions where um, the president has um, sought to influence the attorney general given the severity of the charges against um, uh, Mr. Flynn. Um, I, I think it, it certainly deserves, uh, Congress and has a right to take a look at that and understand exactly why this attorney general thinks that those charges are not sufficient. Uh, and I hope Congress does. I mean, Michael Flynn pled guilty twice in different yes, court one year apart. He knew what he was doing. He had good counsel at the time. A couple other quick questions here. Um, we're in the middle of the 2020 race. In the media last about a week, there's been a big talk, Vice President Biden, with allegations by Tara Reid. I don't want to discuss the allegations. We're still learning it. We're both lawyers. I think we're both waiting. You need more evidence and people can make the decisions based on that. But how do we as Democrats, though, keep a standard where we are standing with women or male victims of sexual abuse, but at the same time balancing that with responsible vetting of anyone's charges so we don't look like hypocrites? Because I, I think you do exactly what you said you would do, is you, you stick to the consistent position, which is to say, these allegations are serious allegations. They deserve to be investigated. The vice pre the difference between what's happened in this case and what's happened in, in many other ones is the vice president has said the same thing. And he has said, they're serious. She deserves to be heard. He says they haven't happened, but he's also calling for that investigation and the disclosure of whatever documentation there is. And that's the difference. And so look, I, I obviously have no insight as to what happened. There's no way I could. Right. But what we can say is that that and that evidence needs to come forward, um, exactly as the vice president said, that she deserves to be heard and that that should, that should take place. And it needs to. And I think that's all that any of us 
that's all that, that, that every, any victim that comes forward deserves to be heard. Um, any def, uh, uh, person that faces those accusations, obviously uh, he or she deserves to be heard um, and have that evidence come out. And so that um, either law enforcement and or the public can, can make up their, their mind as to what happened. The difference again is that the vice president is calling for that process in, in this case. And obviously President Trump has never called for that in the myriad instances where he has been accused. He's just tried to discredit um, the accusers, which as we know, there's been independent corroborating evidence that he's lying. Right, right. I mean, he infamously called the accusers in the close of the 2016 campaign liars who he's gonna sue them all. Um, one of the last two questions before we wrap up here. One is you're in the middle of the Senate race right now against Ed Markey who is known as a pro very progressive guy. Um, and you have said that you'd be more effective than him. Can you share with us, like, where, where has he not been effective? And where could you be more effective if you were in the U.S. Senate? So, Dean, it's a great question. I appreciate you asking. Look, I, um, the reality is that we are in the middle of a crisis, and a crisis that is going to shape this country for an awful long time. When you're talking about a crisis, you need to have leaders that are going to be here in Massachusetts, on the streets in Massachusetts, using the experiences and the challenges of the people in Massachusetts to help craft that policy response and our, our pathway forward. You cannot afford absent leadership. And so one, I don't think Senator Mark has been here enough. I don't think he's here enough now. And I don't think we're, he's, he's shown the leadership that is necessary in order to channel the, the concerns and the dreams of the people of Massachusetts. Two, I do think it's worth examining that record. Um, and if we look at that record, after 9-11, uh, in times of crisis, excuse me, after 9-11, Senator Markey voted for the Iraq War, and he voted for the Patriot Act. In the midst of uh, uh, cocaine and crack epidemic in the 1990s, Senator Markey voted for the crime bill and sent an entire generation of African-American men to jail. And as we come out of this crisis, you can't afford that type of, of judgment that is going to make a massive mistake and then spend years essentially trying to make up for it. You compare that judgment with the way I've handled my campaign over the course of the past six or eight weeks, I was one of the first people in the country to suspend my campaign. I suspended our fundraising operations, we suspended all of our field operations. I had our field team making well being checks to tens of thousands of seniors across Massachusetts, asking if they were okay and connecting them to resources if they needed help. We started using our fundraising list to raise nearly $100,000 for local organizations like the Chelsea Collaborative, like the United Way, that we're gonna provide basic needs and, and the organizations trying to chase down PPE for our first responders. We were handing out meals last week with uh, Wahlburgers restaurants to EMTs and firefighters and paramedics and doctors and nurses and people working at our hospitals to say thank you at a UPS facility to say thank you to the folks that deliver in our packages. And that's, I think, the type of leadership that this moment calls for, along with the vision to say, hey, we got to take on these big structural challenges like ending the filibuster, like ending the electoral college, like campaign finance reform, so that we can deliver on the change that we need to make to make sure that this never happens again. And I think if you put my record up against the senators, you will find a very different story uh, than the one that the senator's been telling. Well, Congressman Kennedy, thank you for your time, especially now during a pandemic. 